Matthew chapter 21, verses 8 through 9, it says, And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. 
the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Would you guys stand and sing this chorus with us? You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You're it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. Yes, you deserve the glory. Amen. Man, are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Let's continue in worship, guys. Shakes the whole 
count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way. The same God who's never late is working in all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh, my days. Oh, yes, I will. look to your neighbor, look to your buddy there, give him a high five, give him a hug, say good morning. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, church family. Thank you. Appreciate that. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the ministers here. Today is an extra special day for several reasons. It's already been a great morning here in the house of the Lord. But I want to introduce you to Michaela Pearden. Everybody say hi, Michaela. And this one's extra special. She has made an incredible decision. She's going to give her life to Jesus today in baptism, as you can probably tell. 
And as her favorite uncle, I am just so excited. Sorry, Kent. We got some out-of-town family here, too. But uh, as one of her uncles that's here, I'm so proud of you, girl. And I'm going to introduce you guys to her parents, these awesome people. Give it up for Jake and Jackie Pearden. Well, thank you, church family. We are so proud of our girl. It's an extra special day. It's her birthday. <laughs> And she wanted to make her eighth birthday extra special, but we're so thankful for family and friends and the groups that she's involved, like GEMS here, thankful for her GEMS leaders. So, Michaela, we are ready when you are, girlfriend. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord, and my Savior. Confession and faith, I will now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So after high school, I started attending culinary school. I found like a true like passion in my life and I started working really really hard on being the best chef I could possibly be like that would always give me fulfillment by the time I hit 30 you know I had achieved all of those things I was in the newspapers I wanted to be in I was in the magazines I wanted to be in but I still felt empty part of being a chef is kind of this rock and roll lifestyle where we you know we work 16 hour days then we drink and smoke cigarettes all night long, and you wake up hungover, and you do the same thing again next day. And that was leading to negative parts of my life. One night, it kind of all came to a head where I had blacked out and threatened my own life. I was shocked, I was horrified. So I um, started to make a commitment to change. So a year later, I'm in Arizona with my future father-in-law. I've been on this probably about a year journey of spiritualism, going through a lot of the, the more new age stuff. Um, and we were debating about uh, religion. And he stopped me in the middle of my sentence and he said, do you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross? And my instant reaction was yes. I, at this point, I've been talking to my brother about scripture and stuff, and him and a group of guys there all invite me to come play pickleball at Creekside. So I ended up coming to pickleball with the guys. I started to find this uh, peer group. Pickleball leads to me asking my brother about church, and that's when I asked him, how do you, how do you go to church? And he said, what do you mean, how do you go to church? You just, you just come on Sunday. And I, uh, I was like, no, but like, what? Do you, but how do you get to church? He's like, listen, man, you just come on Sunday. And then, so that Sunday, uh, we came to church. Me and my family came to church. After coming to Creekside for a little while, I was invited to the men's retreat. And at the men's retreat, you know, there's no more, there's no more hiding. You might as well lean into this and go, you know, go all the way. I felt so broken down, but then instantly lifted up. You know, it was Jesus behind me, lifting me into the light. That weekend, the following Wednesday, I'm at Pickleball, and I have a lot of questions about baptism, because I had been baptized as, you know, a baby, sprinkled water on your head, that type of baptism, but I hadn't chose to be baptized. So Chad explains uh, the, the Greek baptismo translation, has to do with a pickle being, uh, you know, dumped in vinegar and submerged in vinegar and then arising as a pickle. And that like hit me on that chef level. Chad goes, unlocks the church and baptizes me right there at 11.30 after pickleball. It's been a long road, a lot of valleys, it's been a lot of struggles, but my relationship with Jesus has made me a better, father, and husband, and chef. I'm James, and I discovered Jesus at Creekside.
Don't you just love stories like that? How God uses pickles and pickleball to change lives. It's just so awesome. And to see the baptism, uh, what a great, what a great Sunday. Hey, I'm Barry. I'm one of the ministers here at Creekside. And if you are a guest today, like this is your first time, it's great to have you. If it's your first time, your fifth time, 15th time, it's great to have you with us today. We're certainly glad you're here, and we hope you join us next week. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But also, those of you who are joining us online, it's always great to have you with us as well. You're an important part of this fellowship, and we're glad you're here too. So I'm on staff, and one of the things I get to do as a member of the staff, one of the special things I get to do is I get to work with this group every so often, a new group, like three times a year, and we take a 10-week uh, period of time, and we go through this thing where we talk about uh, committing, uh, connecting with ourselves, connecting with others, and connecting with God's purpose in our life. And we call this 10 series session, we call it Rooted. And we're starting a new Rooted in a couple of, month, in a couple of weeks on April the 7th, the Sunday after Easter. And if you have already done Discover Creekside, but you maybe not found a group and you're still trying to figure out a little bit more about all this stuff about uh, Christ and church, Jesus, about everything like that, We'd love to have you take advantage of Rooted. I'd love to see you in there. We can only take about 16 to 18 people, and we only have a few spots left. So the way you would sign up is you can tap your smartphone on the decal in the chair in front of you, and then tap the banner, and then it'll follow. you can follow the links to get registered for that. So we hope you'll do that. That's one thing I wanted to say. And let's talk about next week. Let's talk about Easter. Today is Palm Sunday. Easter is always a lot of fun, and this is going to be my first Easter at Creekside, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about it because Easter is just a fun day, right? The crowds are big. you got four services. You know, the parking lot, it's not going to be full. We'll have plenty of parking, but it's just there's excitement because of the people in the building. There's more students, more kids. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a great experience, and so I'm really looking forward to it. And to accommodate the people we expect to be here, we're going to have Two services on Saturday and two on Sunday. So if you, like, maybe you grew up Catholic and you're like, I, I can do a, sat a Saturday service. I grew up going to Saturday services. That's perfect. You know, we have two Saturday services, one at three, one at five. Maybe you went to Protestant church. You're like, is it legal to go to church on Saturday? Yeah, can you do that? Absolutely. So it definitely counts. So if you want to come to Saturday, 3 and 5, Sunday is 9 and 1045, just like this. We'd love for some of you to consider doing the Saturday service because we expect Sundays to be a little more full. And here's how you can help us. If you'll go on to the app or using the decal uh, to get onto our app, it would really help to know like a breakdown of who's coming to what service. So you can do this thing called a seat saver where you say, we plan on coming to the 3 o'clock service on Saturday or 5 o'clock or any of the four. And that doesn't, like, we don't send you a ticket and you don't have a reserved seat, but we kind of understand how many people are going to be here at each service. And that helps us to know how many people are going to be here. So we would encourage you to do that. Would you please do that? It would be a great big help to us. And, like, for example, if it's like you can't make it to the service you're planning on being at, and you got to come to another one, but you signed up for the other one, we still want you to come. I mean, obviously, we still want you to come, so please do that. And there is a creative way that you can invite your friends that we have available for you. It's out in the lobby. Maybe you noticed them when you came in. There are some bags there, and those bags are for what we call the Egged Initiative. There are some Easter eggs that you can plant in your neighbor's yard that invites them to church, so we'd love to have you uh, invite your friends, and you can use that to do it too, okay? All right, those are the announcements. Let's jump in. Let's have a word of prayer, and let's continue on. Lord, thank you for this time we have together. Uh, when your body, when your people, when your church gathers, it's about you, not about us. We're thankful for the way you move and work in our lives. We're thankful for the way uh, you have demonstrated your love and grace and mercy to us. And so we just, we're thankful for this opportunity, and we just pray for this message. I uh, pray that it lands on hearts as it needs to. Uh, people are able to hear it the way it needs to be heard. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have you guys noticed that when there is good news and bad news, that most people want to hear the bad news first? Have you ever noticed that? There's a woman, uh, and I, I got a, somebody gave me a book by her. She's like got an IQ of like 240. And she was going through this, and she said, 
Most people want the bad news first, but she said it's better to get the good news first. And here's why she said it. She goes, because if you think of your attitude like as a baseline, she goes, when you get the good news first, you go above your baseline. All of a sudden, you're happier than you were before, and then you come back to where you were at the beginning. She says, getting the bad news first, you go below where you were at first, and then you come back to where you were. I thought, that's pretty fascinating. But most people want to hear the bad news first. I heard about a guy who went to see his doctor about a diagnosis, about some kind of health issue he had. And he said, okay, doc, give it to me straight. Give me the bad news first. And the doctor said, well, I really do have some bad news. The doctor said, you've got 10 to live. And the guy said, 10 to live? What do you mean 10 to live? You mean like 10 years, 10 months, 10 weeks? What do you mean 10? And the doctor said, Nine, eight, seven. That's the same response this first service gave me, so I probably should have eliminated it from the sermon, but that's okay. Everybody likes to get the news, but a lot of times we want to hear the bad news first. And am I the only one, but anytime I'm looking at the news or reading the news, watching the news, I'm like, is America okay? Like, is, is, America, is, the, is, is the world okay? And am I the only one, or is it like, I just think I maybe need to stop watching the news. Like, I mean, maybe need to stop reading the news, because it seems like there's so much bad news that whatever good news there is can't overcome the bad. Fortunately, we have the presidential election to look forward to, and that will lighten the mood quite a bit, I'm sure. So that will make everything so much better. I was reading the news on Wednesday, and I saw a headline, and I started reading it. And the news article basically said this, Americans are lonely, stressed about the economy, and don't have a lot of confidence in the country's political leadership. Hmm, yeah, really, it's like, that's news? I think we all recognize that. Like, that is typical, don't you think? That's the way most people feel. It also said the data suggests that particularly Americans under 30 feel worse about their lives than people who are older. They feel less supported by family and friends, less free to make life choices, more stressed, and less satisfied with their living conditions. They also feel less confident in government and feel government is more corrupt than ever. Yeah, it's like just for everybody, young, old, it doesn't matter. It seems just like there's a lot of bad news. So what's the answer to all of the bad news? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a solution to these things? And, and I'm just, I was thinking, okay, what are the things that people might turn to to find the solution to all the bad news? Is the solution to all this bad news more money? Like when you think about it, you go, well, okay, let's, let's be honest. It'd be nice if the economy straightened itself out a little bit more. Like if the cost of groceries went down a little bit and you didn't have to spend as much at restaurants and like housing prices went down and the cost of housing went down and uh, interest rates went down. Wouldn't it be easy if there was an easing of the economy? Yeah. But is that going to solve mankind's greatest problems, our biggest problems? Absolutely not. The Bible says whoever loves money never has enough. Money has never been the answer to our biggest problems. What about government? What about politicians? Look, I think we all understand there is a value in good government. There is a value in in politicians who are working for the good of the people. But are they the solution? Are they the answer to mankind's biggest problems? The answer is no. Like, I mean, I, I thought about this once. There's no government program designed to help people live forever. I mean, everything the government does is essentially about, about the here and now. Now realize that there might be chaplains in the military and people that are paid by our government that do focus people in the right direction, but most of our government is all about the here and now, not on, not on solving the big problems or, or how it can solve the big problems. What about technology, right? Technology is pretty cool. I mean, we can find a recipe to Alfredo, fettuccine Alfredo in about three seconds, right? What's a recipe to fettuccine? Three seconds. I've got it right here in front of me. Technology can connect us to people on the other side of the world in a heartbeat. But is it the answer to our problems? No, we just talked about earlier, like, like people under 30, they're the most connected generation in all of history, but they're feeling lonelier than ever, even though they have social media and everything else. English philosopher and writer Aldous Huxley said, 
technological progress has merely provided us with a more efficient means for going backward. Would you agree with that? I would. And he died in 1963. He died 60 years ago when he said that. And I think it's still as true today as it was then. What is going on? How do we live in a world like this? And I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul wrote to those early first century followers of Jesus and that he writes to you and me. He writes in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. These are just evil days. It's always been that way. And here we are living in a world where there's evil around us and there's a lot of bad news. Is there any good news? Today, we're beginning a, a five-part series, a new five-part series, and it's called the Discovery Series, and we're going to uncover why we believe. Now, during this series, we're going to be focusing on five core fundamental truths, principles that we have discovered, we've seen it in action, we believe these things will change lives. We believe these things change families. We believe these things change marriages. They change attitudes. They change perspectives. They change the amount of hope that people have. They can even change eternities. We believe these things change communities, and they also change the destiny of nations. Now, that's a big task. But we believe these things with all our heart. Now, the things we're going to be looking at, we believe are very real. But the world we live in is not going to accept these things easily. These things are countercultural. The world looks at these things and they say, there is no way these things make that kind of a difference. They've got to be foolish. But we believe it with every fiber of our being. And the truths we're going to talk about come into place in two ways. There's two parts. Part number one is this. We believe in the power of Jesus to change lives. We have seen him do it over and over again, just like we saw in the video with James. We've seen it over and over again, just like people who've been baptized, people all over the world. We believe Jesus changes lives. Now, the world says, we don't believe that. We don't believe Jesus changes lives. We think it's going to be money, or we think it's going to be good business, or we think it's going to be government or politicians. We think it's going to be technology. We don't believe it's going to be, be Jesus. We do. The second part of this is that God has decided to use the church, to use you and me to share the good news of Jesus with others. The world doesn't believe that. Of course the world doesn't believe that. Like, we don't believe it's the church. We think the church is a joke. It's full of hypocrites. It's full of people who don't believe what they say. They don't live like it. They just certainly do their own thing. They're not to be trusted. We don't believe the church. We think it's money. We think it's business. We think it's the conservation uh, initiatives that are going on. We think it's all these other things. It's technology. It's not the church. You've got to be kidding. We believe it with all our heart. It's Jesus. And it's the church sharing the good news of Jesus that makes all the difference in the world. I like something Pastor Chuck said. He said, nothing is more critical for my life my heart and my hope for the future, my hope for tomorrow, than being a part of a church. Nothing is more critical for your life, your heart, your hope for tomorrow, than being part of a church. So one of the things that we offer here at Creekside is this thing called Discover Creekside, where we spend four weeks talking about four very important things. And we're going to be taking those four things out of the classroom and putting them in the pulpit. And during this series, you're going to discover things maybe you've never discovered before about these things we're going to be talking about because we believe it's important that you understand exactly why we believe what we believe. And by the end of the series, as we uncover these things that we believe, we hope that it draws people to Jesus, that people see him more clearly and are drawn to him and say, we want to follow Jesus. We hope and pray that many of you will renew your commitment to the church and to Jesus and that you will join us in the mission of helping people follow Jesus. And we also are looking forward to something on April 21st. On that day, we're having Baptism Sunday. Now, if you are thinking about being baptized and you want to be baptized before the 21st, we will gladly do that anytime. 
But we want to encourage you to consider making April 21st the day that if you thought about it, the day that you decide to be baptized. And also on the 21st, we're going to affirm our commitment to the Creekside as well. So we want to encourage you guys to be here for at least the next five weeks. All right? We'd love to have you here. So there's good news. There's bad news. Today, let's talk about some good news. In 1857, a piece of artwork was discovered in Rome. Maybe you've seen this. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. But it was scratched onto a wall in a building in Rome. And what it really depicts, and I know it's a little hard to see, and there's another picture we're going to put up on the screen if you want to go and put the other picture up on the screen too, so you can kind of get a better feel for it, what it really shows. It shows two people, one standing facing a cross, and a person on a cross, arms stretched out wide, that has the head of a donkey. And the inscription underneath it reads, Alex Aminos worships his God. It's been dated to around 200 A.D., during the height of the Roman Empire, during a time when Christianity was outlawed, and where a lot of Christians were, the church was growing, but the culture it was in just rejected it you know, as a whole, and began to criticize Christians and say, you're foolish for worshiping somebody like a man who died on the cross. And they mocked Jesus. They mocked the cross. And they mocked Alex Aminos for worshiping a man on a cross. 2,000 years later, that hasn't changed. The society we still in still doesn't get it. When you think about, and the reason I wanted you to see that is when you think about the crucifixion, when you think about Jesus dying on the cross, what do you think? I mean, I know probably in here, of course, a lot of us embrace it. Like, we believe in the cross. We understand it. But maybe there's some like, it doesn't make any difference to me. Like, I don't get it. I don't know what's going I don't know about the cross. Do we embrace it? Do we make fun of it? Is it crazy? Is it foolishness? Isn't the cross for people who are weak? Like, don't you rely on Jesus because you have a weak life and a weak constitution and you're trying to figure things out so you turn to religion? Listen, to understand the crucifixion of Jesus is to clearly understand the love that God has for us and the grace that he offers. To understand the cross is to understand the love that God has for us and the grace that he offers. The world may not understand that, but that's what it's about. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. The cross is good news for you and me. It is the way God works. Before we go any further, I hope there's people here today that don't understand the cross. I hope there's people here today that said, you know, I don't even know what it means to go to church. I'm just going to go. And you're trying to figure things out. And you don't understand the cross. And we are glad you're here because we want you to. We want to be able to have you understand what it clearly means. So if you'll give me about 12 minutes, I want to explain to you why the cross is so important. Understanding the cross begins with the understanding that God has a perfect design for our lives, that God has a perfect design for your life. Do you, if you've ever read the creation account in Genesis 1, or maybe you've only heard about it, it's very interesting what God does at the end of each day. So God creates the sun, moon, and the stars. And at the end of each day, when he created the sun, moon, and stars, he said what? It is good. Right, exactly. He created the sea, and he created land, and he said it is Good, right, exactly. He creates vegetation, he creates animals and says it is good. And then he creates the first man and first woman. He creates Adam and Eve. And at the end of that day, he looks back and he sees Adam and, he's, Adam and Eve and he doesn't say it is good. No, he says it is very good. See, humans, men and women, are the crown jewel of God's creation. You can look at all of creation and nothing is more valuable in his eyes than you and me. Men and women, humanity. He loves humanity. It's unlike anything else. And when he created Adam and Eve, he put him in a garden and he walked around with them. He had a relationship with them. He was with them all the time. And that's why you were created. You're created to know God. That is your purpose, to know God and to walk with him. 
John 17, 3 says, and this is real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is true life, knowing God and knowing Jesus. That's why we are here. I love what Ray Pritchard wrote. He wrote, knowing God is the most important thing in life. If you live 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years and you don't know God, then it doesn't matter what else you've done with your life. If you don't know God, you have missed the very reason for your existence. We were created to know God and walk with Him. That is why we are here. That is God's perfect design for our lives. But there's a problem. There's a problem. There's some bad news. The problem is sin. Sin, our sin leads to brokenness and separation from God. Our sin leads to brokenness and separation from God. It was about a month ago that, uh, I guess it was a month ago, four or five, six weeks, I don't know, that my daughter was in town and Lori and I had been to a restaurant and we wanted to take our daughter to this restaurant. And we get there and I drop them off the front door. The parking lot is just jammed. And so I'm driving around the parking lot trying to find a spot. I tell you what, I've lived in Florida since September and here are two things I've learned. Number one, everything needs power washing. And number two, there is never a parking spot open. Everywhere I go, I'm like driving around parking lots, trying to find a parking spot. And I'm driving around, and I'm getting back towards the front of the restaurant. And right when I get there, a guy in the third spot gets in his car and puts on his backup lights. And I'm like, I am already here. I turn on my blinker, and I'm like, that is my spot. And some of you know where this story is going already (laughs) because it happened to you. And he backs up, and right when he backs up, another car comes around the corner and pulls right into that spot. My spot. And here's what really made me mad. As he's pulling in, he goes, to me. Yeah, I know. I heard that. I've got to admit, there's a deep part of my soul that Jesus hasn't changed yet. Because I wanted to get out of the car and throat punch that man as hard as I could. (laughs) But I didn't do that. I prayed for him and I said, Lord, please help that jerk because he obviously doesn't know you. (laughs) There is a problem in our world and it is called sin. And sin is a result of pride and selfishness and arrogance. And guess what? Honestly, the problem isn't just with that man. That problem is with me. Because it is in my life. I have a problem with sin. We all do. That's what Romans 3.23 says, for all have sin. It's not just that man's problem. It's my problem. It's our problem. And here's where this problem leads. Isaiah 59 says, there is nothing wrong with God. The wrong is in you and me. Your wrong-headed lives, wow, that's subtle. Your wrong-headed lives cause the split between you and God, and your sins got between you so that he doesn't hear. I hope you catch that. Our sin creates such a, a split, a chasm between us and God that he doesn't hear us anymore. That's what sin does, because we've chosen to separate ourselves with him because of our sin, because of our pride, because of our arrogance. When it comes to sin, there isn't some magic dust that God has to just sprinkle on our sin and make it go away. He doesn't just snap his fingers, your sin's gone. It doesn't work that way. You know what it requires? You know what's required to forgive sin, to make sin go away? Blood. Blood. The only way for sin to be forgiven is for blood to be shed. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Unless blood is shed, there is no forgiveness of sin. So if it takes the shedding of blood to forgive my sin, that means I should pay for my sin with my blood. Yeah, that's what it means. But here's the good news. God's answer to the problem of sin is the cross. God's answer to the problem of sin is the cross. Now, when we think of the cross, there's two ways to see it. One is in a physical way, like a reporter would see and a reporter would record. You see the physical things going on, right? You see the suffering of Jesus. 
You see the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet. You see it. You, you hear his loneliness on the cross as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like you hurt because of what you see for him. You see what he's going through. You see the shame that Jesus has to go through as he's uncovered bare for all to see. That is the physical. Those are the physical things that are going on. But there's a difference between what you see and what's really going on. That is the physical manifestation. But there is a divine purpose behind the cross. And that's where, that's where we want to go today. That's what we need to see. There is a difference. And Paul describes it perfectly in Romans 5, 6 to 11. If you'd follow along on the screen or in your Bible, Paul writes, when we were utterly helpless. Now, because of our sin, we're helpless because of our sin, utterly helpless. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but that's not us. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, this is what's going on because of the, because of the crucifixion. Because we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Jesus, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies... We will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. Understand what's going on. On the cross, Jesus was dying a substitutionary death for you and me. He was taking our place. And all of that sin in our lives shifted to him on the cross. He was dying in our place, which then meant that when God looks down at us, he no longer sees our sin. That's been shifted to Jesus. He doesn't see him. We've been made righteous. We can now stand before God without guilt because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And because he's died that death and our sin has been shifted to him and God sees us as righteous, we can now be friends with God. Friendship with God was restored. We had it and then with sin we lost it. And now through the cross it has been restored. We have reconciliation with God. Our relationship has been made right. We have this wonderful new relationship because of what Jesus has done. This is the gospel. And this is what changes lives. Jesus died for you and me. We're made righteous in God's sight. And now we can have friendship with God. I know of no other way to try to explain what this is like than to use the illustration concerning my own family. My wife, Lori, and I, we have three kids. We have a son, Austin, who's 29 and lives in Cincinnati with his wife. We have another son, Jake, and he, he's married and and his wife, Maddie, uh, they have a new grandson. We have a new grandson. He was born on October 30th. Uh, I started here on September 11th. In September, he was born on October 30th, so he's about five months old. That's one of our families. They live in Nashville area. We've got a daughter who's like 20, and she's engaged to be married in October. Just a great guy named Akana, and we're looking forward to that. So Lori and I have like seven family members, and, and we love them. Now, I've been here since September. And I've gotten to know some of you all. I love you guys. This is a great church. You're awesome. But I don't think I could give any one of those kids of mine or my grandson for any of you. I, don't, I couldn't give all seven of them for $1,500. they are my kids. I, I, I just don't think I could do it. I couldn't give any one of them for all of you guys. I, I just don't think I could. I'd love to believe I could. I just don't think I could. And it's not because I don't love you. It's just they're my kids. But God, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only begotten son, his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the gospel, that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son for you and just you. If it, there was nobody else, he would have given his one and only son for you. But he's given his one and only son for all of us. That's the good news. And we believe it changes lives. We believe that Jesus changes lives, marriages, families, attitudes, perspectives, hope, eternities, everything. We believe that Jesus changes communities. We believe that Jesus changes nations and the destiny of nations. We believe it with all our heart. Now, my own personal story is this. I fell in love with the church before I fell in love with Jesus. I, was, uh, I grew up going to church as a kid, and when I was in high school, um, some friends of mine invited me to start going to student ministry stuff, and I just fell in love with the church. I fell in love with my friends and being together with them and all that, and following with Jesus actually uh, happened later, but I fell in love with the church first, and so I committed my first part of my ministry to student ministry. I was a student minister for about 11 years, and just two weeks ago, I had a, a great opportunity with the students of our church to uh, go on a mission trip to New Orleans together. And there were 26 of us who went, and 21 high school students, and some of you guys are here and, and went on that trip. And we had five adults. Here's the fascinating thing about the five adults. For those of you who are like, you know, I'm like 30, 40 years old, and uh, you know, working with students is like, that's for younger people. Like the average age of the sponsors on the trip was 56. Like, like 48 was the youngest, I think it went 48, 52, 56, 58, 66, and 21 high schoolers. We had a great time. You're going to see some pictures going on the screen. I mean, one of the things we did in New Orleans as we worked uh, around and did whatever we could to minister to people and share the gospel with people, like one of the things we did was we planted trees uh, around the uh, swamps, and I say swamp now like I've been to New Orleans all my life, planted trees in a swamp in New Orleans, and uh, there's these organizations that are realizing if they don't plant trees, the city is gradually losing space. It's losing ground, and, and things are not working as well as they used to, so they're planting about 30,000 trees to, uh, to protect New Orleans from future hurricanes and flooding and all that kind of stuff. And I think in our two days there, I think we planted, what, like 29,000 of them? It just felt that way. It was hard work on me. I mean, like, I don't normally do that kind of work, and it was hard work, and the kids did awesome. We did that. We helped paint a restaurant for a woman whose husband had owned a restaurant, and um, her husband had owned it, but then he passed away, and she tried to lease it out. But the people who bought it, they stopped paying the rent, and they kind of tore it all up. So we went in and painted the restaurant for her inside so that she could lease it out and start supplementing her income. We helped a guy named Dave who owns a home in the Lower Ninth Ward. Like if you remember Katrina or have ever seen the pictures of Katrina, when the levees broke, it, all the water spilled into the Lower Ninth Ward. And the Lower, Lower Ninth Ward is a very poor part of the city. That's about where we stay. And Dave, he like has goats and chickens and uh, honeybees and he raises mint to give away. And he helps supplement the food, food needs of his community. So we went and helped him out. But the highlight for most of the kids and a lot of the adults is going downtown and working with the rescue mission. And what we do is we go downtown and there's a rescue mission that they have a kitchen and we packed lunches, about 150 lunches, put them in bags. We put them in a couple of uh, grocery carts and then we divide the kids up into two groups and one goes this way and one goes this way. And we start passing out bags of food to people who are hungry. And the mission is only about 100 yards from an overpass. And under the overpass are people who live in tents. It's a tent city. And there's hundreds of people who live here. And, and our students, I'm so proud of them and their humility and their willingness to serve all week. But this was beautiful because they were so eager to help and share the gospel and, and shed, uh, share the love of Jesus with these people. They would go up to people and they would introduce themselves and they'd say, Hi, I'm Bob. Tell me your name. And the people would tell them their name and they said, We have some food. Would you like some food? And they would, almost all of them would say yes, because it was a good meal. And then our students would say, hey, we'd love to pray for you. Is there something we could pray for you about? Can we pray for you right now? 
And like I was watching as these students, and you can see in the pictures, as they kind of surround these people with love and with prayers and their kindness and generosity. It was so awesome. The last picture, though, is a picture of a woman named Lena. And the students had already prayed with her when I got to her. Uh, They had already prayed and given her food. So I was following a little bit behind. And I got to Lena. And I sat down and introduced myself, and she told me her name. And, and I noticed that she was reading something. Can you see in the picture? She's, got, she's reading a Bible. In the midst of all this brokenness and, and chaos, she's sitting on the curb reading her Bible. And I sat down next to her and I said, so I see you reading your Bible. Tell me what you're reading. And she was reading from the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is a, is a book about how to live. Like God's truth, how to apply it. Like here's wisdom. Follow it. And she read the verse she was reading to me. And then I said, let me tell you my favorite verse. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And she looked it up. And I said, would you read it? And she goes, sure. And it said, she said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. And she goes, I like that one too. And I said to her, um, I said, you know what, Lena? I think we'll talk again. I think we'll be able to talk again. And she kind of gave me one of those weird looks. And and I said, don't you think that we're going to see each other in heaven? Don't you think we'll have an opportunity to to renew this conversation there? I mean, I I think we will. And she said, she said, I think so too. Folks, I love the church. I've fallen in love with it. I got a little emotional first service uh, just because I love the church. I love to see students serving. I love to see adults working with students. I love to see people working with children and the children responding to the good news of Jesus. I love the way the church helps people and reaches out to people and shares the good news. I love the way that people give to the church. They give of their time and money and energy to see the church fulfill its purpose. I love to see people supporting one another and praying for one another and loving on one another and playing pickleball with one another and reaching them with Jesus with pickleball. I love seeing the church. I love the church, and I love the gospel. I love the good news that changes lives and changes everything. I love the fact that we were created to know God. The problem is sin. And sin separated us from him. But God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. That is the gospel. And the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover our sin. But it doesn't automatically do that. See, we have to respond to the gospel. We have to choose Jesus as our leader and forgiver to receive forgiveness and spend eternity with him. How do you respond to the gospel? By saying, I want to follow Jesus. Saying, I want to follow Jesus. In just a minute, we're going to move into a time of communion. Because what the cross reminds us of is Jesus gave his body and blood for you and me. And we remember that sacrifice through the emblems of the bread and the juice. And when you came in today, maybe you stopped by one of the tables and you picked up one of those little cups that has the bread and the juice in it. And you've got it with you right now. If you want to go and pull that out and get ready, we're going to do communion together. Or maybe you didn't uh, pick one up. The ushers are going to come forward. They've got the baskets with them. If you'll raise your hand, they'll make sure you get one of the pieces of bread, one of the cups with the bread and the juice. But we are going to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross at this time. So once the ushers come through, You'll maybe have a little bit of time to pray, to be thankful, to ask for forgiveness, to make amends with God for all the things that have gone on in your life this week. But we're going to do that together. So let's take a little time, maybe a minute or so. Let's respond to the gospel through communion.
Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for showing your love and your grace and mercy on the cross. And thank you for the fact that we can come together and we can remember that as a community of people who, who have been broken by sin, but who found hope in you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we respond to the gospel? One of the things we can do is we can say, I want to follow Jesus. And as we sing um, this song, there's going to be some people up here, and maybe you want to talk to one of them about that. We'd encourage you to do that. Maybe you want to pray. Maybe you want to come forward and pray. We've got prayer benches, kneeling benches here if you want to come forward and pray. Or maybe if you want somebody to pray for you, you can come up and talk to one of the people up here. There'll be men and women on both sides, and you can ask them to pray for you, and they'll be glad to. Maybe another way to respond to the gospel is to give. God's given to us. You know, the song you, the song you sing says, Jesus paid it all. So to give back to him is quite natural when you give out of gratitude. And so there's some offering boxes here in the front and back if you want to you make giving your response. And also to sing. When we sing, we're ascribing worth to God for who he is and what he's done. And we're going to certainly ascribe worth to God for what he's done for us on the cross. So whatever your response, let's stand up. And let's do that together.
nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. Church, I don't know about y'all, but whew, I say let's keep worshiping. Anyways, hey, we want you guys to have an amazing week. Go in compassion. We love you guys.